Wonderful. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, last I checked, we had over 50 attendants registered, so that's pretty exciting. Um, I guess I don't get to see you all right now. But I am Shauna from the Bionutrient Food Association, and many of you have either gotten emails from me or we've talked, either sent you beef kits or sharing results. It's been wonderful. Uh, really excited about this opportunity to sit down with the team and um, look through those results because I've had lots of questions coming in. So this is a, a great opportunity. Um, out of respect for the time of people all around the globe, really, who will be participating today, I have a brief outline of how we'll be doing this. And we're going to save the Q&A until everyone has presented. So what we're going to do is start off with Dan Kittredge from the Bionutrient Food Association. He's going to give an overview. Then we're going to hop over to Amanda Pinelli. She's with the Bionutrient Food Association and Institute. Everything of this will get kind of long if I give everybody's where they work. Uh, Dr. Van Vliet, then we'll share examples of fatty acids and mineral data, and we'll be able to look at that together. So hopefully your questions will be answered there. And then we are going to finish up with Eric Smith from Audacious, who will be talking about the future of your results and what that's going to look like going forward. So we do have the chat option enabled. It should be enabled. If you want to introduce yourselves on the side, that would be great. We'd love to see who's here. And then also that's where the questions will be fielded in. But with all of these people speaking, a lot of your questions will be answered in the beginning. Um, but again, after everyone has uh, had their chance to present, then we'll be working through that, that Q&A. So thank you all for being here. And Dan, how about it? Shauna, we're just getting notes that the chat is disabled. <laughs> Show chat. And I would say, uh, yeah, I would say, please feel free to say hi to each other on the chat and and post your your questions in the Q and A so that um, we can watch and try to keep them keep them in, answered um, as we're proceeding, but then also know where they are when we, at the end. Yeah, great idea. Chat. <clears throat> um, okay, I see it on mine, so maybe people could try again. And then Dan, I'll let you get started, and I'll be working on this if it needs to be worked on on this end. Great. Okay, well, uh, welcome everyone. This is great. We got a good solid list of people here showing up. A bunch of names I I, uh, I know. Um, really happy to have you here and be able to go through some of the actual numbers that we've been collecting. Um, this has been a, a long process with the BFA and BI for, gosh, I think we actually formally launched it in the end of 2021. Um, we certainly hoped we would have been done by now, but uh, with a big project like this that's never been done before, you don't know what you're doing, and, <laughs> and there's nobody, nobody to follow, and so and so it's just a, it's a it's a it's it's a it's a process. It's original. It's original research. Um, so thank you all for being on the journey with us. Uh, I'll just sort of run through the broad strokes of the vision and the strategy, and then hand it off to um, Stefan to run through what the results are we've been getting, um, and and how you can understand your results. So the the concept here is um, we have a hypothesis that there's a connection between um, the nutritive value of food, the flavor, the aroma, the health giving attribute, the health of the animal, the health of the environment, the, the ecosystem function, farm viability, um, and that those things can all be, um, you know, we can we can find biochemical markers and, and levels and ratios that correlate with those dynamics. So that's the thesis. And um, yeah, I'm ex really proud actually of all the things that have been done. Uh, talking to Stefan about all the struggles he's had with which calibration to use, which metric, which <laughs> if you're looking for this compound and use of this acid, then you can find it. Use that acid, you can't find it. What is it there or is it not? Because <laughs> so the actual process of doing science is is no is absolutely no joke. Um, we've got people from I think four continents now, um, many hundreds of samples. Um, we do not have all of the types of compounds that we want to have assessed readings for you yet. Uh, we're gonna be reviewing the ones that we have here today. Um, I think the one of the key points that Amanda was wanting to make sure we made was to you know, reinforce that this is a research project. Um, we are not giving you, uh, and with these results, things that you can legally make claims about and not be vulnerable. So. This is a research project. We're working to define nutrient density. At the end of this 
we hope we know what nutrient density is, and then we have a simple test that can be used to, um, you know, rapidly and inexpensively assess that and make claims. But in this, we're in the process right now. This is not a fee for service lab, and I, sorry if that's been part of what people have interpreted or maybe just what they hoped, because uh, I think we were pretty clear about the writing out of it. So. Um, yeah, excited to have everyone here. I won't take any more time. I'm happy to be part of the Q&A session, but there's people who are much more involved in the technical details who have a lot more specific answers uh, for you than I do. So I'll step out of the way with that. Uh, <clears throat> Amanda, any, any final things you wanted to say before I hand it off to Stefan? No, I think, I think you pretty much covered it. I think that just reiterating that we want to support y'all in making good use of knowledge around nutri nutrition, uh, but we're not making we're we're not taking that position of telling you how to use this data and um, how to make claims. It's a it's a complex regulatory framework to navigate, so legal guidance is really the best avenue there. And the BFA is not going to, nor is Adacia is going to take responsibility for that. So I think um, you'll hear from Eric a little later about the products and offerings that they're going to come up with and they're working on to support this transition. Um, but that I, we just want to make that clear from the beginning. Cool. All right, Stefan, take it away. Yes. Thanks so much. Uh, oh, it's, it's, it's great to, uh, uh, to see you all. And I see many of the, the names in the chat uh, that we've known from, uh, from the data. So I'm, I'm glad you're here. And, uh, and again, thanks so much for, uh, yeah, for supporting the the, the research project, um, and uh, we are. Uh, what I'll go over with you today is is that you know where it's like I said, it's a uh, an ongoing process. So we're learning in the process. So we're super grateful for that uh, too. This so year, just as much, uh, hopefully, it'll be beneficial to you, but also just beneficial for the field of learning this. So what I'll take you through is a um, old. Uh, Spreadsheet, I should say. So some of you have received it in an older format, but as we obviously innovate we and learn more, we uh, made new uh, uh, formats. So I'll go through both, talked about some of the fatty acid analysis, the mineral analysis, and then also what's in the pipeline on uh, on, on the finding the, the, the phytochemicals, the secondary metabolites. And uh, as, as Dan described, that was certainly um, a, a very novel area of research, um, which I... Uh, we're getting, uh, I'd say, uh, better and better at and good at. Um, so that data should come uh, here uh, uh, soon too. And after that, we'll continue to move forward with uh, uh, getting um, uh, B vitamins and fat soluble vitamins. And the reason why we're why we're working on this uh, uh, so much is also in a research setting. Is because you know, let's say if you you know, we're trying to do this more more cost effectively and get a lot of these compounds at the, at, at the same time. If you know, like some from since we send some stuff out to uh, Europeans, and uh, if if we do that, and it it's the, the price is, is high for that per per vitamin. So what we're working on is trying to figure out can we get all B vitamins in 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 the same run using uh, proper uh, uh, analytical techniques so that we can. Uh, do this more and more uh, cost effectively. So those are some of the things that uh, that we've been working on on your on your samples, and uh, as as I mentioned, uh, the the yeah the data will come as uh, as we are, uh, but at least know that uh, myself and and various of the of the team members, uh, the, some of it I know Travis is here today and a few other ones uh, that worked very hard on this, uh, which would be. Uh, uh, um, Ray, Jen Cloward. Uh, Camille Middendorf, Marina, who are all in within the group at uh, at, at USU, uh, uh, that uh, have been part of the group effort. So, without further ado, let me share. Um, or if Dan or Amanda or Sean, I could give me screen sharing opportunity, and then I will share the screen, and then we could talk about the the, the fatty acid analysis. At the moment, I'm not able to share my screen. If it's you, Shauna, you're the host. Are you there, Shauna? Yeah, I hear you. Let's see. Uh, one participant can share at a time. Let's try this. Stefan, did that work? That worked. Yep. Okay, great. Great. 
Great. So these are the, the example of our of our older our older format. Um, we start to add more individual information about uh, about biological effects. But this is uh, an, an example. Um, I, I labeled it Farmer Smith. It's it's, it's not Eric Smith, uh, but I just uh, uh, blinded uh, this. Um, so as you can see here, we we study a number of uh, of different fatty acids and uh, uh, various saturated fatty acids. And typically, how they interpret uh, the data would be, and, and uh, is is that when you get more of these long chain saturated fatty acids, they're typically considered healthier for you. Um, so, arachidic and behenic are specifically highlighted here in the in the conditional formatting, and and basically what this does is is that it just is for the for the reader for you uh, an easy way to uh, to cue in on what. Uh, uh, which samples were higher. So let's say Farmer Smith here, 0.1% um, of the fatty acids was arachidic acid. This was higher than uh, the average grass-fed beef ribeye and higher, twice as high than the average grain-fed beef ribeye. So this is what, what that means. Now, I do want to highlight that at, at present, and this is also part of why we are collecting so many samples and are trying to understand, and, and as Dan mentioned, define beef nutrient density, we know that higher levels of these are considered beneficial, but what we don't know exactly yet, and that's why we're gathering this data, is, is that is there a certain level of this that is, for instance, considered beneficial? Um, because right now it is green, yellow, red, and it basically is, means this value is higher, this is intermediate and this is the lowest. But is point, uh, 0.12 better than point 0.1? This is the question, uh, right? They're, they're fairly close to each other. They're clearly higher than the, than the grain-fed beef. But these um, is what we're trying to figure out on series of these values. Is there sort of a, a cutoff where we can say, okay, if you hit, hit this threshold, this is a, what is considered a beneficial uh, level. Um, so that this is how it's uh, how it's formatted. It does not per se mean that this is bad. Is what uh, is is what I'm saying. Um, then other things that we've highlighted. I mean, most of the the, the data in fatty acids revolves around um, the omega sixes and omega threes. So linoleic acid is a dominant omega six. Typically, it is higher in, in grain-fed beef than grass-fed beef, but in this particular sample, there was some linoleic acid in there. It could be because of uh, that the animals with maybe some uh, uh, some forages or that were, uh, I should say, conserved forages. It could be because some of the plants that they were grazing was high in linoleic acid. But just looking at linoleic acid does not tell the full story because this sample was also particularly high in omega-3 fatty acids. And omega-3 fatty acids are considered uh, uh, beneficial for, for our health. We don't consume a, enough of that in the, in the American diet. Uh, and grass-fed beef is a way of, of potentially increasing this. And we're doing follow-up studies as, as part of this research project too, where we're gonna feed some of this beef, um, and this is through a USDA project, to people to see, okay, and this will help us further understand, do these levels, also measurably impact the omega-3s in your blood because then obviously this will be important also for for farmers to understand for grass-fed farmers and also with marketing and and consumer education like hey you know this is uh, also meaningful because we can actually improve the omega-3 levels in in your blood when people eat this uh, versus grain-fed beef where we expect it won't be in, increased and and there have been one or two studies done with the grass-fed beef that, that would suggest that, but uh, none of them have been done in, uh, in, in North America. One in Australia uh, back in the 90s, and then uh, one in, uh, in Ireland uh, in, the, in the 2010. So we certainly need a lot more data. But again here, alpha-linoleic acid is a major uh, omega-3 fatty acid found in fresh uh, uh, forages, in, in, uh, so on pasture or even when you're uh, feeding uh, uh, things such as alfalfa or other conserved forages, uh, but grain is, is known to be particularly low in this. So this compound is converted to EPA, DPA, and DHA, which are uh, omega-3 fatty acids in, uh, in, in uh, animals such as us, but also in the cows. So having a direct source of this would be beneficial. So 
For instance, you can see here, this sample contains six times more than, uh, than grain-fed beef and uh, uh, is also one and a half times higher than uh, uh, your typical values. So this is what that means. And the green means that this value is the highest out of these. So if that makes sense. And um, can I just interrupt, Stefan, yes. just a couple of points? Um, <clears throat> on the, I think it was a C18, 2N6 linoleic. Yeah. The, it was 4.13, which was high. But if you look over to the right, you see the sample one, two, and three. That's right. And one of them was 6.9, which was really, really high. Yep. And the other were 2.9 and 2.56, which are below the average for the grass fed. So that's that right. 4.13 you're seeing there is the average of your three samples. I would say whoever this farmer was, they sent two samples from cows that were doing one thing and a third sample from a cow that was doing a third thing. Yep. And so your averages are going to be off because of that. So That's right. if you have this, if you've got the report that looks like this, understand that you can see those three different animals there. Um, and, the, and the number you're seeing on the left is sort of your average. Your average. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for highlighting uh, that, Dan. That is right. And these samples did look very distinct because you can see that here on the on the ALA content as well. So yeah. there was there was there were definitely some some differences there on those uh, on those samples. Yes. And, and just to, for you uh, for you to uh, highlight this and how we did the conditional conditional formatting, this was just an easy way of seeing like uh, which ones are higher. And you know, it, it's we're, we're trying to understand like can we come up with a with like a cutoff if we have enough data? Like okay, these samples consistently show uh, show high values, but let's say if we uh, um, took the conditional formatting off of here, it's it's essentially um, if we if we clear the rule here and now we were just interested in seeing okay. We know that higher levels are considered a little bit more uh, uh, negative here. So red for the highest levels, green for in, uh, for the lowest, and and yellow for uh, for intermediate. And uh, but it is true here that this would be an overall uh, uh, of, of of your samples. So one thing we do have a lot of knowledge on at this point, just through through the literature, are omega six to three ratios. So this is essentially uh, the omega-6 value divided by the omega-3 value. And typically here, anything that is considered, so the uh, probably in the past, the human diet had an omega-6 to 3 uh, levels in our diet, below 4 to 1, uh, below 3 to 1. And, and the standard American diet has an omega-6 to 3 ratio of, of uh, about 15 uh, to 18 to 1. So we consume a lot more omega-6s then we do omega-3 so it's really the lack of omega-3s that's the issue so if we can provide uh better omega-6 omega to 3 ratios to uh, to consumers we, we expect that that is going to be associated with improved health and this is really i think the main biomarker um that is now emerging to uh look at uh, when we when we study grass for beef samples so Typically, anything below, you know, uh, two and a half, two, between one and two is considered to be very, very beneficial. And feedlot beef is, is considered typically around eight, which is uh, definitely on the higher end. Now, I will tell you whether an omega-6 to 3 ratio of 1.75 uh, versus 1.25, whether that 1.25 is a whole lot better, I, I doubt it. I think once you're in that range, range of like uh, two to one, uh, one and a half to one or so, you are looking looking very good. And and what we noticed too as well, when we looked at uh, sort of broadly, so the reason why these grass-fed samples are a little bit higher than the average is because we also bought off the shelf grass-fed samples and these were typically a little bit higher but what we see is that all of you who use and and it's the vast majority of, of grass-fed samples that used rotational grazing practices almost uh the vast majority of you are around that uh one to one two to one range so in a uh, very low um and i would say Anything that you consider below two to one or, or two and a half to one is considered uh, very, very beneficial. And this um, is something that hopefully in the past can be used also as authentication and uh, potentially uh, labeling and, and, and marketing. I think uh, if you ask me what is the, the lowest hanging fruit at the moment, 
I think starting with with omega threes and omega sixty three ratios as uh, as as potentially uh, uh, educating consumers and then maybe doing some some uh, uh, package uh, uh, claims. So this is I think one of the strongest ones uh, uh, to use. Um, then let me um, go to a newer format. It looks it looks very similar, but we've also been working on uh, on on our newer format. Where uh, again here we would see data from from Farmer Smith. Again here we'd look at the omega six to three ratios, but we also started to add um, uh, a little bit of additional information on on this as well. Um, so I'll, I'll, here, if you are interested in in reading about the uh, the description and and the biological effects as well. So for all of those, we have biological effects. If you look at uh, um, for instance, S, we can see that there is a, a right variety of the biological effects that are uh, that are described. Um, here, for instance, we say the omega-6 to 3 ratio is important. Uh, high intakes of omega-6 can uh, improve or, or promote inflammation. So a higher ratio is typically considered better. So and we have descriptions now for all of uh, all of these as well. Um, and also the main thing to look at here is you know, we, we know that there's benefits to having uh, various of the omega-3. So again, here, the conditional formatting means is that highest in this sample, intermediate in these, and then uh, lowest in this. So um, so again, this is just a quick way of, of looking at how uh, how does your data relate uh, to, to others. Um, but again, here, one of the key parts of understanding is, is ultimately... Um, what are considered nutrient dense samples, and I think we're getting a good good handle on this. And this is one thing so we're moving forward with. Also, is is that uh, coming up with ratios what we think are uh, uh, beneficial. And and for now, I'd say what we're learning is is that most farmers, the vast majority, I'd say ninety percent that uses rotational grazing practices are below this this two to one ratio, which is an excellent uh, uh, ratio. So we can see that uh, here and then these are the individual samples again uh, but that is also why we relied on three so we didn't put all of our all the eggs in the, in one basket then if we go over the the minerals again here we are looking at a combination of heavy metals as well as minerals so heavy metals you typically want lower levels of these in uh, in your sample uh, though admittedly um, many of the values here uh, remain below any uh, any safety levels. Um, but uh, if you look at this sample, for instance, and the main things we're, we're focusing on specifically here is is uh, the minerals that are provided through through beef, which would be uh, uh, iron is is a key one here. Uh, zinc are ones that are uh, are, are typically important. Um, as well as uh, magnesium and, and 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 copper. So in this this sample, at particularly low levels of of, of copper compared to other grass fed samples, uh, the reason for that is uh, not 100 known, but it could be that the forages or the or the soil was uh, uh, presumably lower in the, in in this element, whereas uh, uh, iron was uh, was was higher than uh, the average grass fed and and, and grain fed samples. The reason why um, again here. Um, we highlight these uh, uh, specifically with uh, in terms of heavy metals and, and minerals, whereas the minerals are typically considered uh, uh, beneficial and, uh, and uh, heavy metals, uh, typically lower levels would be uh, uh, considered beneficial. Um, then uh, just a uh, further update, what you'll see as we, when we get more and more of the data done, we will start adding more uh, templates and keep updating the client to the template for, for you all with uh, uh, phytochemicals, which would be the next part. And then after that, there will be B vitamins and, uh, and, and fat soluble vitamins as well. Um, so with that, I uh, like to pass, uh, pass it over and I'm happy uh, uh, to, uh, um, Answer let's any have, questions later. Let's have Eric Eric speak in a minute. But I think there's a couple of questions that came in sure. here. Um, uh, uh, Sam asks, is there a reason why we didn't get mineral analysis results? My understanding is you did, but maybe you didn't know where they were in the report. Um, Shauna and Stefan, I think probably the best people to answer that question. I was, oh. One of the first things to address here was, was helping you read the report you've got. And I think everybody should have both the minerals and the fatty acids. 
I was going to respond briefly that there were one or two that were missing. I don't believe it was Sam's, but I will look into that and share it. But probably along the lines of what you were saying, Dan, is that the tabs down at the bottom of where your results were shared, there should yeah. be a mineral. Oh, okay. There should be a mineral tab that you can go to. If not, I will, I'm taking, a, making a list right here and we'll be double checking on that and sending them to you. Yeah, then uh, absolutely, Sam. We'll, we'll get you the the the, the results uh, if if they if, would, you, if you don't know how to use spreadsheets or you're not totally conversant with spreadsheets like I am, um, <clears throat> yes, there's a little tab at the bottom where you have to click that one and it opens up a whole new spreadsheet. That might be the answer. Okay. Well, we can we can. It seems like uh, Charles looking into it. We we'll 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 get you the results then, uh, uh, Sam. We'll we'll look into that for sure. Cool. Um, all right, so I think Eric is next up on the agenda to talk about um, our partnership with Audacious. And, you know, there's a number of things we didn't know we didn't have or <laughs> thought we had but wasn't good enough. And one of them was the ability to actually hold all this data in one database and convert it into meaningful reports in a systematized fashion. And Audacious has been setting up a, a, a company to do all kinds of wonderful things, but one of them, one of the things they've got done is this whole thing, or it's not done yet, but they're 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 much farther along than anybody else is. And so um, instead of having to have Shauna spend many, many hours and Stefan doing many, many hours putting together individual reports, uh, what we've got coming forward here with Audacious is a much more systematized process. So um, I think that's mostly what we were hoping to share about what you're doing, Eric, and, and why we're really happy to be working with you because <laughs> we need this. <laughs> um, but yeah, please, please tell us what Audacious is doing and 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 how you see this going forward from your Great. side. Thanks, Dan. Um, so um, the amount of work that goes into this is extensive, as you've all seen from the amount of time that it's taken to bring this forward and show you your results. and. So there's so much science uh, happening in the background in terms of drawing these connections and these relationships. Um, so what Audacious is doing is we're trying to bring uh, a technology foundation to make this scalable and deployable. Um, so taking a step back, um, my name is Eric Smith. Uh, I'm the CEO and founder of Audacious. And we are a technology platform for both the science and the software to be able to uh, get into the so what of how do you tell the story? How do you look at this data? How do you look at this information? Uh, we can all see the complexity uh, and Stefan's doing such great work to help simplify that complexity. Um, but when you get down to these individual nutrients, they can become really challenging to uh, tell a complete story. And so um, I previously was in, the, in a funding role, uh, working and funding a lot of the work with BFA to help uh, try and scale a lot of these concepts. And what Dan and I realized is this really needed um, a commercial effort that could help to systemize, uh, raise capital, and, and bring this solution to the market so that people had the tools and technology they need to communicate effectively the nutritional quality of their food products. Uh, but not only that, to be able to tie it back to the ecological outcomes that we are so interested in managing for um, and optimizing for. So uh, I have a small presentation here that'll walk you through a little bit uh, about what we're doing um, and, and kind of show basically what's coming down the pipe uh, in terms of uh, what Audacious and the Bionutrient Food Association are trying to uh, bring to the market uh, with Stefan's support, of course. So. Um, we, uh, the basis of what Audacious is doing is trying to bring you, uh, tools to help distill very complex information. Uh, so our company, uh, has two components. One is our lab where we do all of our analytical testing, uh, basically what Stefan is doing at his lab. Uh, we also do that at our lab, uh, and generate the similar, uh, basically the same results, uh, to, to be able to report and share that. The other side of it is the uh, platform by which you'll be able to visualize and see your results. Uh, and that platform will help you to uh, compare, share, uh, learn, understand, 
look at the different composition, connect that back to management practices, um, and, and really tie uh, all of the learnings together. So what you're seeing here is a few snapshots of what that product and that experience is going to look like. Uh, and the great news is, uh, as part of this partnership with the BFA, all of your data uh, will be viewable to you as a study participant on our platform. Um, so you will get uh, an email in the coming months that will say that your samples are now viewable on the Audacious platform. Uh, so you'll be able to log in with your account uh, and be able to see your results. And basically, Stefan's spreadsheet will be viewable in this product format. Um, so um, taking a step back for one second, I forgot to mention, like traditionally when you as a producer share information with your customers, you would share what's a spec sheet, right? So the spec sheet that we are looking to bring and make actionable for you is really what you're going to see and what's going to be available on the platform. So you'll be able to kind of go in and see your samples and really begin to understand uh, the context of these samples and what is included in them. Um, the functionality and the features will be pretty basic uh, out of the gate, and it'll really tell you, uh, put it into context in terms of FDA nutritional guidelines, uh, how much of that daily value that you're contributing uh, based on your results, uh, based on serving size, um, and really allow you to like zoom in on those daily values and what you're actually getting. Um, Additionally, uh, all of the management data will be attached to your samples. So you will be able to see uh, that kind of sample data and what that looks like. Uh, we don't have good visualizations on this yet, but we'll show you and then it'll all be ready when we invite you to come onto the platform. Um, but that will be stored and accessible by you as the uh, study participant. Um, what we're really trying to bring and what the contract is focused that the, the partnership with uh, BFA is focusing on is allowing you to see in context of the study how you're performing. How are you doing relative to the rest of the study participants and the rest of the data that exists within that platform? Um, privacy is really important to us. And so what you'll be able to see is just your results uh, against the anonymized study data. And so you can see in this image the blue dots, which would be kind of your samples, but BFA will be making a lot of these results public and no one will be able to see your specific results unless you opt in to sharing those results. Um, and that's something you'll, you'll be involved in and discuss, but for the purposes of BFA and the purposes of this being an academic study, the goal is to put this information out in the world, but we, and so we are helping BFA to do that, or we're helping them to do that in a way that's uh, anonymized and has uh, no attribution back to the original data or the owner of that data, which is you as the study participant. Um, yeah, so that, that's kind of the basic concepts. Um, I will make just a few statements on, on claims here. I think just like Stefan said, everyone is really interested in making claims and is asking themselves how, how to go about making claims. So the first thing is a bit of a disclaimer, right? Is um, Stefan and Utah State and Audacious and BFA uh, do not support nor uh, intended for this data and this study to be the basis of making claims. The basis of this was academic research and having the data to have an informed conversation about the nutritional density of various practices and how they produce certain nutritional outcomes in food. Um, but if you, uh, so we are not, uh, this is not set up to support you to be able to make those claims. And, um, but if you want to go be, and, and part of the reason that is, is uh, the regulatory guidelines for making claims are very specific. And so if you are interested in going beyond to make claims, uh, BFA, uh, including Amanda or myself can really talk to you about that uh, and what that process involves. But just for context is why we don't recommend making claims off of this data is uh, one, it's, it's dated information at this point. And two, uh, sample sizes are, are smaller relative to what the FDA and the USDA recommend for actually 
uh, ensuring accountability around making claims around that data. Um, we can talk more about that. I'm sure there's gonna be questions, um, but again, the focus of this work and the focus of Dan and the BFA is really to drive the conversation around nutrient density. And the BFA has done a fantastic job with this study, with the support of Stefan to showcase the variability of nutritional quality that is in our beef and why uh, and how we can attribute those back to management practices. So um, I'll stop there and uh, we can jump into Q&A and all of that. Beautiful. <clears throat> um, well, I've got both the Q&A open and the chat open, and I see questions in both. Um, I can, I'll just start pulling them out here. Um, Paul says, where do heavy metals come from in pasture? Uh, <clears throat> I think when I was presenting at, at um, Grassfed Exchange um, in Pennsylvania, I you know showed a slide that showed that some of the some of the grass-fed producers had very high levels of, of these heavy metals. A lot of them did not, but some of them did. And someone in the audience came up to me and said uh, they had had this experience. They tracked it down. It seemed like it was coming from their salt lick, basically their free choice minerals. I can't remember which company it was, but basically it had tainted. It did have the manganese and the copper and the zinc, but it also had some of the other things in it. Um, I can't remember the name of the company, but... As I understand it, that was well, that, that's the only thing I've heard. But I'm not sure, Stefan. Do you have any other? Yeah, I mean, it's it's beyond know. control the the farmer typically. But uh, um, <clears throat> one thing that we're talking about with the USDA, I think, uh, is also you know there's certain hot spots of those uh, uh, heavy metals as well. Uh, maybe due to industrial zones, due to historic uh, how the land was was used in the past. Um, so. Um, it might be need be in the soil uh, because of that. You know, one one thing we're looking at is like we know what we're trying to. We have the geographical location of these farms, and I'm not sure we'll see if it materialized. We're trying to find additional grant uh, funding on this through the USDA um, to see if we can study like PFAS, for instance, samples too, and and look at more uh, agricultural contaminants. So just to understand what is uh, what is what is potentially causing that. So it could be. Yeah, I mean. Soil would be an obvious one to test, uh, as well as the mineral block, as well as the water that is uh, that is being provided to the animals. But like I said, oftentimes that is just if uh, uh, if you <laughs> were close or downstream of a chemical plant, then yeah, that's beyond your control. But there's things that can be done about it, which is some forages are are more likely to uh, uh, provide it than others. Uh, also, and this is one of the things that need to be understood, uh, because we're not saying don't produce beef there by any means. Because, uh, but if that becomes clear, then yeah, indeed, like Gillian Butler says, it's a mineral fertilizer. So if that was done historically, that's uh, that could be a case uh, too. So yeah. Um, Sonia asked a question at the beginning about sharing the omega three, omega six ratios. I think Eric spoke to that to some degree, which was, you know, if it is, which it seems to be right now, like. Until we know what nutrient density is, omega-6, omega-3 is something people understand. We can There are formal tests for it. And if those are claims that you want to be making, um, then you effectively need to be sending in, was it six or 12 samples, Eric? And they don't necessarily, it's not like they have to cost $500 per sample like it does with our project because we're looking at hundreds of different compounds in that $500. So if it's a, you just want to make claims about your omega-6, omega-3 ratio, there is a formal process we can support you in doing, um, which is pretty clear, um, and and that that's that that path is that path is there. <clears throat> um, Eric, so, any yeah. Other? So again, we we do not advise making claims and take no based, responsibility based on this, based based on on this study. Right. Um, you like from the three parties on this call, we recommend you talking to counsel, legal, whoever you need to like, but. Overall, um, there's very specific rules for how that works. And again, we can have separate calls on that. Um, but the the basis of making uh, omega-6, omega-3 ratio claims is um, has to do with uh, how you communicate this information. And it needs to be state factual statements. Uh, and that factual statement can be our omega-6, omega-3 ratio is X. Um, but 
given that maybe the animals came from two years ago uh, and it was a long-term study, someone might have an issue with how you're presenting that information or what the context is. I do think when Stefan publishes the study, you may be able to say something like, according to a study in which we participated in, uh, we had these ratios and you can cite back to the study. So it's making a very specific time bound call out to a study that is published. Um, and, and so, but other than that, like the three parties do not recommend taking this data to run and making claims off of. And we do hope that study will be done by the end of this year. So we're not going to be dragging it on till 2029. But uh, yes, <laughs> it has taken longer than we'd hoped it had. I see another question here from Kevin. Can we see the forage analysis analysis that shows copper levels? So there's a bunch of data that you don't have yet in your report, I think, which includes the forage data, which includes um, some secondary metabolites. Yeah, I think you have some, but not all of them. Um, as well, the microbiome data. I don't know if people have access to the microbiome data yet. And maybe there's some, some vitamins. Stefan, there's I think there's at least three or four. Well, I think I think Shauna can address these oh, if you want to let get, let Shauna jump in as to what people have and don't have and timing of all that. Shauna, can you help out with that question? Yes. What you have currently in your folders, the fatty acids and minerals, is what we have completed. Um, we've been updating some of those farmer folders with your soil results, your forage results, and your mic. Well, the microbiome isn't even in those yet, but the correlations haven't been made. So um, just kind of reiterating that we're partway through the study. And so this, we were trying to get information into everyone's hands. So you have something to look at and something to, you know, start to ponder, um, you know, how you're managing and that type of thing. So results are coming. It will mean more when we have those correlations, especially with like the microbiome so that we can give you, give you advice on that. But um, there is more mineral, not more mineral data, nutrient levels data coming. Stefan, we think we have B vitamins. We have what, terpenes coming. I don't remember. The phytochemicals are, not, uh, phytochemicals. are coming as well. All of the yeah. phenolic data, phytochemicals is coming. Like uh, there's there's a lot yet that hasn't yes. been shared. Yep. Yeah. So if, if anything, this is maybe like a teaser of like <laughs> some information. <laughs> well, and, and Travis just mentioned too. Yeah. So some of you with the updated fatty acids and mineral data on your tabs at the bottom, you'll see there are only two tabs that are marked as done. So your fatty acids and minerals, there are multiple tabs there. That's all information that we're planning on having, but hopefully through the Audacious platform and not through the um, your your farmer folder platform. I think that's the plan currently is that the future information will be released in the Audacious mm -hmm. report, right? We're not going to be sending these spreadsheets out anymore. It's all going to be, here's your platform. Here's your, here's your link to your page on the Audacious platform where you can see all, the, all your stuff. That's our, that's our current plans. I understand it. Yes, it's very exciting. And I think people will be very happy with how that looks. You have no idea how much hassle <laughs> is involved in just getting data transferred from here to there. <laughs> yeah. And for the people who are mentioning in the chat that maybe you're not seeing your mineral data, Travis and I are both working on that right now. I have a list and he's updating as he sees. So if you have reached out on there, I do have a list and we'll, we will be working on that just to clarify that for the, the people popping up in the chat. Lots of action in the chat and things getting solved <laughs> in real time. Um, Mary asks, uh, do fatty acids, vitamins change over time with beef aging? Um, Stefan or Eric, I mean, as, as I understand it, the, the older the animal is, oftentimes the higher levels of secondary metabolites are present, but either of you can maybe speak to that? Yeah, that's, that's right. Well, I mean, fat soluble compounds, they accumulate longer. So, do you, uh, uh, but is it more like, is the question about storage or is it about uh, she Older said animals. aging, which I think probably she was implying post-harvest, but I think it's relevant to bring up both um, age of animal and then post-harvest as well. It, yeah, I mean, it, it is something we're looking into if, if a steak stays longer, but at, at present, um, there is... What we've at least been seeing is, is that there's not a whole lot of change in the omega-6 to 3 ratio. So uh over time if that makes sense like it with if you age seven versus 14 days or if you uh leave them in the freezer for a long time 
it, it does seem that the fatty acids are fairly fairly stable under frozen conditions. So, so my point is, is that if you have an omega six to three ratio of one and a half, it's not all going to suddenly be three or something like that or four. We see no indication of that. Post harvest, it doesn't change, but but you but you have seen differences in with age, the age of the animal and levels of some nutritive compounds. Uh, yeah, but not not per se fatty acids. Uh, fatty the, the nutritive right. compounds that we see changing are, are fat soluble vitamins and, and, and if the fat soluble phytochemicals. So if an animal lives longer, this is why maybe I don't know if some of you have ever all ate a, a steak from an old dairy animal that was a couple of years old, the, the, the fat is incredibly orange. Uh, and that is because of carotenoids have accumulated and other fat soil metabolites have accumulated over a longer period of time. We, we're, we're actually doing some of that testing right now. Um, and it's, it's incredible to see how different uh, the results are. Um, but overall, the answer is yes. Um, uh, production, processing, <laughs> preparation, uh, all of it changes uh, a little bit throughout through, throughout those systems. And so it is interesting because a lot of these uh, secondary plant metabolites uh, do get cooked in the preparation process. Um, and so um, one of the things we're collaborating with on the study is terpenes. And the way we measure those terpenes is those samples get heated. And so we see uh, a difference in the terpene levels uh, pre and post that heating process. So we know that that happens when you're doing steak and, and cooking it, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's not important. It doesn't mean that you can't make claims based on terpene levels in a raw steak just because of the cooking preparation process. So um, it's complicated. Uh. <laughs> and if the terpenes were there and they broke down into their component parts, in the cooking process, but they were still there in the steak when you ate it, and your gut was going to digest them into the component parts anyways before you use them, then that's not necessarily a bad thing. But again, to go to like, to be able to say 80 out of 100, 20 out of 100 is like no small task. <laughs> um, I, Tony has the question, I assume these studies are being peer reviewed in the scientific community. Where can we see these reviews? Is there any controversy or disputes about this study? Um, we have not published anything yet, but what we're trying to tell you is we're in the middle of the study. And so um, it, it certainly will be published and then uh, you, you, I'm sure you'll be aware of it and then we'll see what, this, what controversy comes. Um, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I mean, you know, we're, <clears throat> like I said, someone pointed out the, uh, a paper from Cynthia Daly at Chico State, which was published 10 years ago. And then there's some other data that has been, but it's just that, you know, like the, the scale of the study is larger. And and what is nice about this study is that's in commercial farms, right? And previously it was more in like uh, uh, research settings. So academic uh, uh, farms, research farms at the university. So, I mean, we are in line with with that mentioning that we're finding that you know people use rotational grazing practices good stewards of the land they end up with the best omega-6 to 3 ratios and uh, yeah i don't think that will be a very controversial statement but uh, i you know uh, i'm sure there's there's people that would uh, uh yeah maybe find that controversial but uh yeah the fatty acids is uh, is, is 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 a, is a fairly uh there's a lot a lot of historic research on this. So we're just contributing to that on, on a larger scale. Maybe the chemicals will be, I don't know if that will be controversial either. I mean, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I see a question here from Melissa Larson. Um, it was a good <laughs> pragmatic question from, from Melissa. Um, can you share expected next steps with timelines? I think I heard phytochemicals, B vitamins, fat soluble vitamins, management practices, Audacious platform, all completed by year end 2024. Do you have milestone dates to share? Thank you. Um, so on the on the audacious side, I think um, in the next few months, we can't promise a specific timeline, uh, but we will receive an invitation to view the completed results uh, that have been uh, that Stefan has signed off on and pushed back to BFA, uh, and so those will be viewable in our platform and you will be invited to participate. Um, and then um, Stefan is working on the rest of that list, which is the phytochemicals, the B vitamins, the fat soluble vitamins. Um, 
and that will be also over the course of the next six to nine months um, if we're, we're just trying to be conservative. Um, and all of that will again be viewable through the Audacious platform. Um, and then the we are working to tie the management data to your results. So that is also viewable uh, on, on our platform as well. Um, and I saw a few questions on, on the linkages. And so, um, Stefan, maybe you want to talk about just like the correlations and how you're thinking about the publishing and communicating uh, the findings of the relationships between management practices and nutritional outcomes. For sure. Yeah, I also have some uh, some some slides to share about that on, on what we're uh, uh, how we're thinking about this. So if you look at uh, at, at this uh, uh, part over here. You know, we're trying to explore different linkages on uh, on this, and this is more of like from from sort of the scientific portion of it. But again, we will translate this with audacious to uh to something that uh, uh is is very easy to understand. But one thing that, for instance, we're looking at, we're looking at a number of things. This would be uh, uh soil health metrics. But one thing that we've, we're particularly seeing uh, appear is is plant diversity, sort of the idea of plant diversity, and and what this means here is that. As the number of plants on pasture increase, and we seem to see uh, a cutoff at around uh, uh, seven to eight plants, uh, definitely diminishing returns over 10, is that uh, the meat omega-6 to 3 ratio is lower. And, and remember, lower is considered better here. So one of the things that we'll find, and, and I think what is going to be so far a major conclusion also in, because uh, we we're in the process of preparing a fatty acid uh, paper, and, um, and, and that will come out this year. And um, one of the things we're finding is, is that the number of plants on pasture. So for those of you who, who have a, uh, a more diversified pasture or have been working on getting a more diversified pasture, we typically see that these perform better than, than, than monocultures. And then the rotational grazing part is another, another key part that we see pop up in terms of like uh, 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 the farms that have the lowest omega-6 to 3 ratios are the ones that have uh, decent plant diversity do not overgraze and uh, rotationally graze. So those are, are some of the things that uh, that we'll, we'll start to explore uh, uh, in, in that paper and then uh, also uh, on the Edacious platform. Cool. Any other questions that people saw come up that I missed <clears throat> or topics? I, I saw a question about uh, the whether the, the fatty acid percentages can be translated into uh, um uh, milligrams per 100 grams i think eric can update on that on, on potential proximal analysis yeah um so a bit of a context again on the study so yeah. we um when we when we started the study we really were looking at this within the confines of this study and i think this is an important point i know dan and, and stefan have made this uh, a few times but it's it was all relative to the results within the study and that is important because that was the framing for this research. Well, how is everything relative to one another? Um, what took so long was Stefan had to go back to the drawing board to then change these results into absolute values so that you could all get concentration numbers as part of this work. And I can't, having our own lab where we also do these analyses, he did this faster, like his team did this at a speed that I am impressed with now having gone through this ourselves. Um, so there's a lot of science going behind the scenes on this, especially when it comes to things like phytochemicals and secondary plant metabolites. So it's like, it seems like a long time, but this is cutting edge research that is happening. And so like, that's why we're here. Um, so the results that you have um, in, in talking about fatty acid concentrations and getting them from relative to absolute values, we're in the final steps of building um, uh, the right frames to measure total fat against which we can apply uh, the fatty acid concentrations or the, the percent uh, values. And so that also should be pushed out to through the Audacious platform to you in the next, uh, let's call it by, by halfway through this year, just to be on the safe side. But we're, we're all working as fast as possible to make that accessible to you.
Yeah, uh, um, yeah, that's a good point. Also, just to give you a little bit of background, as, as the study evolved, right? Initially, we we're going to do more of an untargeted metabolomics analysis, and and some of you early adopters in the study have received that data as well. But then, as 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 we uh, the study evolved, we I think, and it was a good move in the end. Is what is the absolute value on this? Um, so that also means why uh, instead of you know with an untargeted approach, we would get all of these vitamins and phytochemicals off of one shot. But uh, we know that different extraction procedures are not optimized for, you know, it's it's a trade-off. So if you, one extraction procedure gives you the phytochemicals effectively out, but maybe not all get all the B vitamins effectively out. If you're comparing relative, that doesn't matter. But what we're working on now is, is that um, different extraction procedures for all of these that are optimized for each individual uh, group of compounds. So. And I think moving forward, that will be more informative and more, more helpful. But it, it did mean that we went from this on target approach where you just look at everything under the sun. And even if you extract 100th of the B vitamin, doesn't matter. Our instrument can still measure it. And sample A relative to sample B still holds up. But if you want to put an absolute value on it, uh, the extraction procedures need to be optimized. And then one thing that we're also trying to do is then trying to offer these at, at a more cost effective rate. Is I, I asked for a quote at one of the major uh, uh, companies, and and they came back to me per sample over, uh, no, not be able to do phytochemicals over three thousand dollars, right? And that's not uh, uh, a viable strategy uh, uh, mo moving forward. So, so those are some of the things that, uh, uh, that uh, yeah, uh, it's, it's behind the scenes is happening. But I, I must admit, you know, I, I know it's 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 taken a while, and and I uh, uh, I'm super appreciative of. of all that you have done because you're contributing to uh, to to a research study and uh, and know that we're working our our uh, our hardest to uh, uh, yeah get this get this to uh, uh, fruition further. So, but that's great. I had two questions pop up. Um, one was there are some people chatting that would like to be able to communicate with each other, and um, I'm making notes of that and trying to figure out a way because one of the things that's important in this study is that people are anonymous. So we will brainstorm as a team of how best to get you guys in connection with each other if you wanna be. And then the other one, and I found this question interesting. Um, Stefan, this might be for you or, or maybe Dan, but uh, Michael's asking about um, saying his rotation plan is on yeah. maybe three separate pastures over different amounts of time. What are you finding is the most impactful on the meat quality in terms of time on that forage or on that pasture? What what, what you feed the la animal the last three months is, uh, is 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 key, given what we know about the turnover of these uh, these compounds. So, uh, if you're looking to, and I think a lot of farmers just from you know, visiting farmers uh, do that, is put your finishers on your on your highest quality forages. So. Um, so how does it influence our data of only from the last range of slaughter? That's actually what we wanted because that's going to have the, uh, and which is why for in the, in the instructions, we asked for something that was, you know, within the last 30 to 60 days or so, because that's going to have the most impact on it. So. And the questionnaire hopefully would capture that management data. The, ma the management questionnaire would capture the, what was the whole life cycle of this animal, not just what was it doing before slaughter, but but how old was it? How was it fed? Da, 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 da. Um, so we should have that captured. You should have answered those questions. Um, but I think Stefan, it's something like one to two percent of the of the meat in the animal is replaced every day. So you know, basically within the last three months, the flesh has rebuilt itself. As our bodies always are, yeah. we're constantly rebuilding ourselves. And that's the it's one to two percent a day of the meat is constantly being rebuilt in the animals. I understand it. Yes, um, yes. The, a lot uh, of these compounds are are bound to uh, to protein, and proteins turn over at about one one to two percent a day. So, so even though the animal looked the same, it's uh, it's hind leg or or whatever piece you want to look at, uh, will have will have been renewed. All the proteins will have been renewed after about uh, ninety to one hundred twenty days. So, so what you put in the animal at the end is key. But I do want to highlight also, it's like. It is, and, and I'm sure many of you can appreciate it, it is, of course, also a lifetime accumulation. It's not like you want to, uh, uh, 
you, you know, feed, uh, feed a grain, sure. feed a grain for its first 12 months and then finish it on. on yeah. Grass. Well, if you're going to do it that, that way, probably be better. But, but I'll also just to kind of give you, and, and we noticed from experimental work, let's say you start here and then 120 days in the feedlot, you're about three times lower in these phytochemicals after about 120 days. So that tells you also that you uh, see this decrease. And that's why we know that there's this, this 120 days is key. Yeah. Just think about, I see again more questions popping up on the, the claims and the study stuff. And so, just like last time, like um, it's okay to talk about that you're participating in a study and that you've got results. And I think it's okay to even share those results uh, referencing the study um, as long as you link back to that. But because there's not published results yet, there's not something to point people back to, right? And we just want to talk about risk levels for you as a producer. Your risk increases the more places you communicate it, right? So if people are coming to the farm, share, you know, all, all the good stuff and talk about results. Uh, I personally would not put anything on package. I would never print stuff that is not, um, you know, coming through a lab with a certificate of analysis and, and like has, uh, you know, a regulatory guideline around it. Um, but I think it's very important that you do communicate this and the results of the study. And Stefan and Dan are working very hard to make sure that you can communicate and reference back to these results. But um, it's it's a little bit of the Wild West. Adacious is trying to bring you a simplified tool for doing this stuff. Um, it's just not ready yet. And we're all working our hardest to, to bring that to you. Great. <clears throat> Feel free to reach out, Kathy, on, on doing an article. Um, yeah, I think we should try to get at least maybe we can send an email around to everybody saying, would you mind if your contact info was shared with everybody else? And if you say yes, then we can do it. I think it's there's a wonderful community here. I'm, I'm really I'm so honored by all the people who've showed up and taken part in this project. And we should be helping you um, communicate with each other. Um, so we'll make that internal note. I think we've used up our hour and. Um, Hope everyone's had a good time. Any any final final words or, or comments? Anybody has? No? All right. Well, thank you all and uh, enjoy the rest of the winter. <laughs> <clears throat>